for singing this morning. You all like our Christmas songs, don't you? Yeah. You probably thought you were going to get a Christmas message this morning, didn't you? Well, you're going to be a little disappointed if that's what you were looking for. Today, today's sermon may seem a little out of place with it being the Advent season in that. And I'm sure a lot of churches have already begun the Christmas series or else they'll start it today. But uh, we're not going to do that today. Um, we'll address Christmas next week. Today, as I, as I prayed about what to speak about today and uh, that, uh, I felt really pressed by the Lord to talk about the church. The church. Every time I tried to do something else this week, and at one point my study looked like an exploded bookmobile because I kept digging and I thought, you know, come on, God, do something else. This doesn't, you know, and that, but didn't work. Or again, I would hear somebody say the word church. Now, after Pastor Kurt's announcement last week about Pastor Tom retiring and, and Kurt uh, filling his spot at the pulpit there, um, I've heard a lot of this church, that church. And not in a bad way at all. I don't mean that at all, but just the term church. And I even used it today when I, I talked about a friend of mine was pastoring a little church. Um, and uh, so one of the things I felt compelled to speak about today is I want to make sure we understand what the term church means when we use that phrase. Okay? What, and what it means to the Lord. And if, if it's important to the Lord and what it means to Him, that's what it should mean to us as His children and followers of Jesus Christ. So we're going to speak to that today. Oh, you know, we, we use the term, I'm going to go to church, and we talk about gathering here, right? Well, the gathering part is right. Uh, the, the definition of church, the Greek word is the ekklesia. The ekklesia in the definition of ecclesia is a the called out ones. The ones who are called out together. And it's not uh, specifically a, uh, a religious word or a biblical word because they used to call it like in uh, uh, old in Bible times they gathered at the city gates to do their business. And the elders of the village when they were gathered to do that, they were the called out ones. They were the ecclesia of that group. The the, uh, for lack of a better phrase, the local politician guys that come out to take care of that stuff. But for us, the ecclesia means the called out ones. The scripture we're going to start with is in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, I believe through the doctrinal teachings and the times that we've talked about it, that you folks understand that the church is not this building, right? The church is not any building. We the people are the church. Jesus did not build any building or monuments. But what he did was he left behind a group of believers whose lives were transformed. That's what makes the church. So as we look at this today, I want us to see where the church come from. So, the first question we have is who built the church? Well, from the scripture, in verse 18, it said, Jesus says, and I tell you, I will build my church. Jesus built the church. 
And when Jesus says he built the church, he's not talking. Jesus didn't make denominations, and he didn't design, you know, for that to happen and anything. He's talking about the universal church, the New Testament universal church, which is all believers from Pentecost to the rapture. And that's what Jesus is speaking about here. Okay, So Jesus built the church, and who did he use? The scripture tells us he used Peter. It says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, Peter. He says, you are Peter. There's, a, uh, there's kind of a play on words here that Jesus used. Uh, in the Greek, Peter is Petro. And it's spelled capital P E T R O S. In the in the original language, Petros means a large piece of rock. A large piece of rock. But later on, he says that that uh, so rock. The Greek word for rock is Petra. It's a lowercase small small p E T R A. Jesus kind of used that as a, a little uh, play on words there when he was talking to Peter. And the, the definition of Petra is a huge or massive rock. And the example that they used was like the rock of Gibraltar, something that you absolutely cannot miss. It's just huge and massive. So Jesus is going to use Peter in a big way to build the church. But we have to remember the church is built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Okay? And the scripture tells us that. He's the cornerstone in Ephesians chapter 2. Don't lose Matthew. We'll be bouncing in and out of that here for a while. Hold your finger there. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 20. It says, Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Cornerstone was the first huge rock that was put on any structure that was built in the foundation. And it was set level, flat, and it was set square. And everything was built off that. It was the beginning piece that was put into place. Okay? And everything else referred and, and referenced off that cornerstone. And that's what Jesus was. In Acts chapter 4, in verse 11, it says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. And in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3 and verse 11, It says, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The whole foundation of the church is Jesus Christ. Okay? And so we know that that's how it's built. It starts with Jesus. Then he used the apostles. If you're back in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ the Son of the living God. That testimony, that confession of faith that he had in Jesus, the, the revelation God gave him of who Jesus was, is what he built. That's the rock that he used to build the church. Ephesians 2, 2 and 20. I'm going to have to get a wider thing here if I'm going to have all these. Ephesians 2, uh, 19 and 20 says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. See, the apostles, all the apostles were, had a personal contact with Jesus Christ. They all knew that he was the son of God. And it was their confession of faith that they continued to build on the church with. That's the foundation. What we actually have, that, that we teach in that, are the teachings of the apostles. As the Holy Spirit directed holy men to write them down. These are the things that they learned while they walked and, and ate and spent time with Jesus. 
So we know Jesus is the cornerstone. He, he's the foundation of the church. The apostles, their, their testimony and their confession of faith in him, their, their firm belief in that, led to what we are today. The believers are the church. Look at uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through 8. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become a cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. See, as believers, we become part of that church, that foundation, for people that will come behind us. We're the ones that need to be today learning about these things, where the church came from, what it is. So when new people come, when God calls unbelievers to come here, we can accurately and biblically explain to them what the church is. Believers are living stones in God's building. Each time someone trusts Christ, that means when they accept Him as their Lord and Savior, another stone is gathered from the pit of sin and cemented by grace into the church. We're placed in here by God. And His grace is what gets us here. Now, isn't it a privilege to be part of His church? Scripture tells us we are a dwelling place for God. In Ephesians 2 and 22, it says, In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. A church building or a meeting place is sometimes called God's house, right? We all use that phrase, this is God's house, right? We are God's house. We are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. He lives within us. And we gather together at times like this to celebrate that and to worship God for, for the gift He gives us. See, in reality, God's household is not a building, but it's a group of people. Just like it's assembled here today. He lives in us and he shows himself to, uh, to a watching world. And he does that through us. How we behave and how we speak and how we respond to the things that are going on around us. That's how God reveals himself. Not just by our actions and our words, but also by our grace and mercy that we pass on to people. The same grace and mercy that, that we claim and, and we just hang on to desperately like drowning men you know, or women, right? We need that. He shows us that. He dwells or lives in the hearts of those who have trusted Jesus Christ. Think about this for a minute. Kind of a visual thing. You know, I've told you before, my brain works on visuals, right? The church today, when we're done worshiping and fellowshipping, will get in their cars and leave the parking lot. But this building will stay here. But the church will leave. And it should go out and carry on the work throughout the week that we've been called to do, every one of us. So the rock that Jesus built his church on was first the testimony of Peter and the other apostles, then by us today, that we tell people Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of the living God. And that's what we celebrate this time. Here's a little Christmas for you so you'll be totally disappointed. That's what we celebrate now is the coming of that Son of God. So He could do this. So He could build this church that we would have. That we would be a part of. And here's the good news of all of that that we learned from Scripture. 
The message has never changed. God continues to build his church today exactly the same way that it happened that Jesus is speaking of here in the scripture with Paul and the other apostles. Because of our statement of faith, because of our conviction that Jesus Christ was born, was raised, came here, died on the cross to pay our sin debt and accomplished that. And because of that, God accepts us today as his children by our faith in that. Very same message. And it will be that way forever, forever. In Matthew 16 and 19, the word says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Peter was given the keys of the kingdom. A key is a badge of power or authority. Does anybody have a key to some place they shouldn't be going? Typically not, right? If you're given a key, you're given authority to go wherever that key will take you. Whether it be in the house or a, a building or whatever. Okay. In verse 18, it says that the gates of hell will the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell are a reference to eternal death. See, hell is a place that people go that are eternally separated from God. It's eternal death. The keys, the kingdom of heaven that it speaks of, is a reference to eternal life. So we look forward to the day that we, we step into that eternal life. Peter was given the authority to use the power of testimony to share the gospel message when the time was right. Remember, Jesus said, he told him not to tell anyone who he was because the timing wasn't right. Okay, then yes, yeah, still working out God's timetable. It was Peter who opened the door or the gate of Christian opportunity to Israel on the day of Pentecost. You can, can read that in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 through 42. And, it, and also, he gave the keys uh, to Christian opportunity he, to the Gentiles in the house of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 48. So please, I ask that we remember this. The church must be built upon testimony to Jesus Christ. is crucified, has risen from the dead, ascended, and made head over all things in the church. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 through 23, says this, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. See, when Peter come to understand that, what the, and then he understood what the church meant. He describes it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. He says this about us. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, in verse 9 of this, we are given the key to the kingdom. We're given permission to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Dr. Warren Worsby says this, quote, We belong to one family and share the same divine nature. We are living stones in one building and priests serving in one temple. We are citizens of the same heavenly homeland. Jesus Christ is the source and center of this unity. If we center our attention and affection on him, we will walk and work together. If we focus on ourselves, we will only cause division and the pull. You know what a priest's job is? 
The priest's job is to be an intermediary between sinful man and God. To take care of the sacrifices and that that was needed. That's what the priest did then. That's our job now, is to be that intermediary. To be that church. To share our testimony and our faith about Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Scripture that we've seen today makes it clear that the church is not a building. It is not an institution. Nor is it an organization. It's a group of believers whose lives were transformed through Jesus Christ. The church is built by Jesus, it's owned by Jesus, and it's led by Jesus. And it should always be the same. It should always be the same. It's an alive organism that adjusts and changes, and it will not be defeated. Amen? Jesus said, gates of hell ain't going to defeat this. He didn't say ain't, that's hell really talk. It's not going to defeat it. Change isn't going to do it. People come and go. And I don't mean that lightly. I'm not saying that. But, but we have to recognize the church. He called Peter. They sent people out. All through the, all through, we've been studying the book of Acts on Thursday night. And it's all about the growth of the New Testament church. And everybody who was serious about serving God was sent someplace. You know, uh, I mentioned to somebody here a couple weeks ago, other, other than uh, the Van Valkenburg twins, nobody else has been raised in this church totally, Right? We all came here from someplace else. And God put us together for a time such as this today to lean on each other and to help each other through all the trouble we see. That's what the church does. And that will never change. Jesus Christ will never change. We're told in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. It's never going to change. So friends, in closing, I would ask you this. Please, don't just do church. Be the church. Touch lives for Jesus Christ. That's what the scripture speaks of. To touch lives for Jesus Christ. Then we are the church. Amen? Amen. Okay. That ends the sermon. We have some other business to take care of today, though. Um, I got lots of notes here, so I don't forget things that are happening. I will keep Kurt and Tommy up here for a moment. We have lots of room here to handle.